good afternoon, respectable chairperson, my professors, my teachers, seniors, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me having a chance to participate in this academic symposium. And the topic I'm going to present today is optimization in the management of coronary artery disease. So this is the outline of my presentation. First of all is the introduction, followed by guideline-directed management and therapy of coronary artery disease. And finally is the role of STLT2 inhibitors in management of CAT. So what is the coronary artery disease? It is a pathological process characterized by atherosclerotic plaque accumulation in the epicardial arteries. It can be obstructive or non-obstructive. And the clinical presentation may be either acute coronary syndrome or chronic coronary syndrome. So it is a dynamic process of atherosclerosis and altered arterial function. And it is the long stable periods of long course and in between it can become unstable any time with the, and then present with the acute coronary syndrome. It can be higher in high risk patients like a and control, risk factor control, and sub optimal lifestyle modification patients or medical uh, poor control with the medical therapy patients. So this is the underlying mechanism of the myocardial ischemia in coronary artery disease. It can occur both in epicardial coronary arteries as well as the coronary microcirculation. So in case of epicardiac arteries, the mechanism can be atherosclerosis or vasospastic disease. And in case of microcirculation, there will be microvascular dysfunction uh, leading to coronary physiology impairment and myocardial blood flow impairment. But these all three mechanisms can coexist in the same patient. In the management of coronary artery disease, we have the ultimate goals of treatment for reduction of the cardiac death Second is the reduction of the non-filter ischemic events. And third is the reduction in the disease progression. And finally is reduction of the symptoms and functional limitations of our patients. So this is the management of the acute coronary syndrome. This is the acute coronary syndrome spectrum. And the patient uh, can present to us with the recent changes in clinical symptoms or signs, like uh, increasing chest pain or symptoms or persistent chest pain or symptoms. But in some times, the patient can present to us with cardiogenic shock or acute heart failure, and sometimes they present to us with a cardiac arrest. So at that time, uh, we have to decide with the ECT, and the, if there is the ST elevation in the ECT, it is ST elevation MI, and if there is a ST depression, we have to check the cardiac troponin concentrations, and if it is raised, it is NSTEMI, and not raised, it is unstable antenna. And in case of cardiac arrest, the patient can present with the malignant arrhythmias in ECT. So this is the overview of initial trials, management and investigation of patients with signs and symptoms potentially consistent with ACS. So if the patient present to us with a prolonged cardiac sounding chest pain of more than 15 minutes and on recurrent chest pain within one hour, uh, it is to emphasize that we have to get the ECT diagnosis within 10 minutes. At the same time, we have to take the brief clinical history and not to miss the focused physical examination, including checking for the presence of all major passes, measurement of blood pressure in both arms, and auscultation of the heart and lungs for uh, mammals and crackles, and we have to check for the circulatory compromise or not. After that, we have to uh, check the HS troponin level at the same time, and we have to get the working diagnosis of STEMI or non-STEMI to decide the immediate angiography, primary PCI, or fibrinolysis strategy we have to chosen. So this is the pathways to invasive management of myocardial revascularization. Because in ACS STEMI patient, the invasive management strategies are time sensitive, and timely PCI with concomitant antithrombotic drugs is the key to reduce the ischemic risk of patients with ACS. So if the patient present to us with the primary PCI capable center, we have to decide for the, with the aim of uh, wire crossing to the infarct-related artery within 60 minutes, that is within one hour, we have to decide for the primary PCI strategy. And if the patient present to us with a non-PCI capable center or in the ambulance, we have to decide for if we can transfer the patient directly to the primary PCI center within uh, 120 minutes, 
BCI can be capable or not, we have to decide. And if we cannot do the primary BCI within 120 minutes with the aim of wire crossing to infrared related artery within 90 minutes, we have to decide for the primary BCI strategy. And if we cannot do the primary BCI within 90 minutes of wire crossing, we have to decide for the fibrinolytic strategy with the aim of less than 10 minutes to little bolus. Their goal is to reduce their total ischemic time of our patients. So if we choose the primary PCI strategy, we have to open up the infarct-related artery during the intex procedure with the class 1A recommendation. But if we cannot open up the infarct-related artery because of the primary PCI not feasible or unsuccessful, and if the large area of myocardium is in jeopardy, we can refer to the emergency care bridge. This is the strategy for the NSTEMI. In case of the NSD elevation MI, we have to decide for the risk criteria. Uh, very high risk criteria include hemodynamic instability or cardiogenic shock, recurrent or ongoing chest pain, refractory to medical treatment, or acute heart failure presumed secondary to ongoing myocardial ischemia, or life-threatening arrhythmias or cardiac arrest after presentation, or there is mechanical complications or recurrent dynamic ECG changes with the intermittent SD elevation. If these criteria are present, uh, we, we diagnose as the very high risk and STEMI, and we have to choose the immediate invasive strategy with the class one recommendation. If there's a high risk criteria like uh, dynamic SD, or T-wave changes, transient SD elevation, or grace risk score of more than 140, we can decide for the inpatient invasive strategy with class 1 recommendation and early within 24 hours invasive strategy with the 2A recommendation. If these high-risk criteria are not met, we can decide either inpatient or selective invasive strategy uh, according to the guideline. So this is the recommended default antithrombotic therapy regimes in ACS. In case of STEMI and NSTEMI, the M-fractionated heparin is the class 1 recommendation anticoagulation of use, and routine antiplatelet pretreatment is aspirin is a must with a class 1 recommendation, and for potent P2-1-12 inhibitors, in STEMI cases, uh, we can give uh, brassicryl or tecagrylol pretreatment with a class 2B recommendation, and in case of NSTEMI, we have to give only when the coronary anatomy is known. And the choice of p 2 inhibitor depends on the, if we can uh, get the prosecrol and ticacrylor in uh, available, we have to choose for ACS patient, and if it is not available or contraindicated, clopidogrel can be used. And for D4 DAPT for the first 12 months is aspirin plus p 2 inhibitor followed by aspirin for the after one year. And there are, for high bleeding risk patient, there are two strategies of DAPT strategy. We can use the abbreviated DAPT strategy in case of high bleeding risk patient with a one-month DAPT or two, three-month DAPT or six-month DAPT according to the patient's profile. And after that, we can use the p 2 12 inhibitor or aspirin monotherapy. Or another regime strategy is the DAPT de-escalation strategy. That is, we have to use the aspirin with prasugrel or tecagrylor as the potent p 2 12 inhibitor-based DAPT for one month. After that, we can de-escalate to potent p 2 12 inhibitor to clopidogrel, and up to 12 months, we can use aspirin and clopidogrel. And next topic is the chronic coronary syndrome. It is defined by the different evolutionary phase of CAD except acute coronary syndrome, and there are six common scenarios of chronic coronary syndrome. First is the patient with suspected CAD with stable antenna signs and symptoms or dyspnea. And second is the patient with new onset heart failure or LV dysfunction. And third is asymptomatic and symptomatic patients with stabilized symptoms less than one year after ACS or recent reverse. Or fourth is the asymptomatic and symptomatic patients more than one year after initial diagnosis or revascularization. And fifth is the patient with suspected vasospastic or microvascular disease. And the last is CAD detected at the screening. So in this case, we have to use the pretest probability and clinical likelihood of CAD. And if there is the very high pretest probability or clinical likelihood, we can directly go to undergo the invasive angiography with the functional assessment like FFR, or if there 
there is the risk is breeders probability is very low and the low clinical likelihood. We can use the anatomical non-invasive test like CT coronary angiogram to rule out the coronary artery disease. In between the pretest probability and clinical likelihoods, uh, we can use either functional non-invasive tests like stress echo, myocardial perfusion scan, or finally is exercise ECG we can use also. And if there is a documented ischemia of large area of ischemia in more than 10% of LV or diameter stenosis or more than 90% or infunctional chest FFR less than or equal to 0.8 or LVEF less than 35 is due to assumed to be CAD, we have to decide for the invasive coronary angiography in case of chronic coronary syndrome. This is the long-term management after ACS and in CCS. So when the patient discharged after acute coronary syndrome, we have to discharge with the cardioprotective medications and we have to start the lifestyle management and we have to refer to the cardiac rehab. And we, can, we have to also arrange for OPD, refu OPD appointment for other comorbidities and need to uh, arrange for the follow-up visit. The healthy lifestyle modifications include smoking cessation, healthy diet, regular exercise, healthy weight, and psychosocial management. And we have to continue the optimal pharmacological and cardioprotective treatment with the antithrombotic therapy, lipid lowering therapy, with the aim of the LDL target of less than 1.4 millimole per liter with the, for the hypertension control with the blood pressure target of less than 130 by 80, and diabetic control with the aim of A1C less than 7. Uh, the targets are also the same in the chronic coronary syndrome patient. In this case, there's a step one uh, target is a lifestyle modification, LDL target of less than 1.8, blood pressure target of less than 130, and antithrombotic therapy. After that, we need to intensify the treatment based on the residual tenure CVD risks, lifetime CVD risks, comorbidities and patient preference up to systolic blood pressure target of less than 130 and LDL of less than 1.4 millimeter millimole per liter. Regarding lipid lowering therapy, in patient with ACS, if the patient is the lipid lowering therapy naive patient, we have to initiate with the high potency, high dose statin. If the patient is already on low potency, low dose statin, we have to change to high potency, high dose statin. And after follow up with the four to six week, we have to check there's a target is reached or not up to the LDL target of 1.4 millimole per liter. We have to add on exetamide. If still not target is reached, we have to add on PCSK9 inhibitors. This is the same with the NAN as uh, chronic coronary syndrome uh, cases. Also, uh, in these cases, statin, acetamide, and PCSK9 inhibitors are indicated, but the risk target level is uh, according to the risk category of the CCS patient. Uh, for example, very high risk patient with established ASCVD and uh, diabetes with target organ damage, severe CKD, and the cardiovascular tenure risk of more than 10%, the target LDL target will be the same as the ACS patient with 1.4 millimole per liter. Next is the recommendation of the cardioprotective treatment for event prevention in ACS and CCS. For beta blockers in ACS patient, if the EF is less than 40%, regardless of the heart failure symptoms, we have to give beta blockers with the 1A recommendation. And if LVEF is uh, not considered, we have to give with the 2A recommendation. For RAA system inhibitors, ACI are recommended in ACS patients with heart failure symptoms, EF of less than or equal to 40%, diabetes, hypertension, and OCKD. We have to give with 1A recommendation, and all patients, regardless of the EF, with, we can give with a 2A recommendation. For the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, in ACS patients, it is recommended in EF less than or equal to 40% or heart failure or diabetes with a 1A recommendation. It is also more or less the same in the CCS patient. Beta blockers are recommended in patients with LV dysfunction or systolic heart failure with 1A recommendation. And if the patient has a previous TAMI, long-term or a treatment uh, can be given with beta blocker. For ACEI, ACEI or ALB are recommended if a patient has other conditions like a heart failure, hypertension, or diabetes, we can give ACEI with any recommendation in CCS patient. And if CCS patient at very high 
risk of cardiovascular event, we can keep with the two-way recommendation. Next topic is the diabetes and coronary artery disease. The ACS patients with diabetes are more commonly present with the non-specific symptoms, leading to delay in both diagnosis and the access to treatment. They have also more advanced coronary artery disease at diagnosis and more worse long-term prognosis. So all patients with ACS, regardless of the history of diabetes, we have to check for their glycemic status evaluated during hospitalization. And the recent trial evidence shown that the reduction in the risk of new ACS event, heart failure or renal impairment with STLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor antagonists in, independent of the baseline HbA1c levels. This is the algorithm of the management of CAD and diabetes. If the patient presents to us with cardiovascular disease, we need to check if the patient has diabetes mellitus or not. And vice versa, if the patient presents to us with the type 2 diabetes, we need to check also if there is a cardiovascular disease or chronic kidney disease. If the patient has type 2 diabetes with ASCVD, we need to reduce cardiovascular risks independent of glucose control with the STLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 receptor antagonist with a class 1 recommendation. And if the patient has type 2 diabetes with heart failure, we have to start straightly with the STLT2 inhibitor as a class 1 recommendation. And if the patient has type 2 diabetes with CKD, uh, we need to reduce cardiovascular and kidney failure risks by STLT2 inhibitors and phenarino. For CCS patient and diabetes, uh, according to the ASCVD and very high risk, STLT2 inhibitor and or GLP-1 receptor is, agonist is the class 1 recommendation. And if the patient is high risk, metformin and or STLT2 and GLP-1 receptor agonist is uh, class 2B. So this is the 2023 ESC guideline of the management of cardiovascular disease in patients with diabetes. It is recommended that to prioritize the use of glucose-lowering agent with proven CV benefit, it should be followed by agents with proven CV safety over other agents. So SGLT2 inhibitor and GLP-1 receptor agonists are the uh, drugs with the proven CV benefit. So they have, we have to use these drugs with their class 1A recommendation. So this is the flow chart. To reduce the CV risks independent of glucose control, we have to use the LCL, SDLT2 inhibitor and GLP-1 receptor agonist with the class 1 recommendation, independent of hemoglobin A1C level, independent of the concomitant other glucose lowering medication. If we need the additional glucose control, Again, we have to choose the agents with suggested CV benefit, like uh, metformin with the class 2A and pyoglitazone class 2B if there's uh, no signs of heart failure. And others are the glucose lowering agents with proven C CV safety like DPP-4 inhibitor. The SDRG2 inhibitor, the r 2 is only in this group. And sulfonylurea glimipride or cliclazide, insulin clergin or diglutec, and other GLP-1 receptor agonists like um, Xanatide. And these are based on the clinical trials like Amber Red, Canvas, Declare, Timmy, like, etc. I will discuss later. So next is the evidence of SGLT2 inhibitors in management of CAD. SGLT2, what is SGLT2? It is a glucose transporter, reabsorbs approximately 90% of glucose in the proximal tubule, and only little glucose is excreted in the urine through sodium glucose co transporter. In type 2 diabetes, there is a dysregulation of glucose homeostasis, so SGLT2 is a therapeutic target for the management of type 2 diabetes. There are various types of SGLT2, but only two types of SGLT, SGLT1 and 2, are important for the reabsorption of filter glucose from the kidney with different functions. This is the comparison of SGLT2 and 1. SGLT2 is a high-capacity transporter, but low affinity for glucose. One molecule of glucose is co-transported for each sodium ion, and about 90% of renal glucose reabsorption is carried out by SGLT2 in the first segment of the proximal tubule and major transporter of glucose in the kidney. For SGLT1, it is low capacity transporter, but high affinity for glucose. One molecule of glucose is co-transported for two sodium ions, and about 10% of the renal glucose reabsorption is carried out by SGLT1, located in the third segment of the proximal tubule, and it is a major transporter of glucose in the intestine. So mode of action of the SGLT2 inhibitor, it blocks transport of glucose by SGLT2 competing with the glucose for binding sites. Then they reduce the glucose reabsorption in the proximal tubule, leading to urinary glucose excretion at a lower threshold concentration. 
with the potential benefits of lower plasma glucose weight loss, improved beta cell function and insulin resistance, and lower blood pressure. For the cardioprotection mechanism or SGLT2 inhibitors, it has multiple direct and indirect mechanisms, and it can improve by many aspects like hemodynamics, metabolism, oxidative stress, and in inflammation. So these cardiovascular benefits are not related to the antihyperglycemic effect of SGLT2. So this is the proposed mechanism. SGLT2 inhibitors causes gly increased glycosuria and increased natriuresis, causing uh, increased urinary volume and then a reduction in the circulating volume and systemic uh, blood pressure. After that, uh, reduce cardiac preload and afterload, then improvement of the cardiovascular structure and function. Another uh, cardiac sodium hydrogen exchange is reduced and by the uh, increased protection of the arena, uh, it also improves the cardiac, uh, cardiovascular structure and function. Finally, the cardiovascular benefits of SGLT2 are achieved. And these are the possible cardiovascular benefits by the glycemic control and attenuation of the glucotoxicity, natriuresis, diuresis, and reduction in plasma volume. After that, reduction in PP, and amelioration of the endothelial dysfunction and vascular stiffness, improvement of the cardiac energy metabolism by increased ketone protection and utilization, and inhibition of cardiac sodium hydrogen uh, exchange with the attenuation of the cardiac remodeling and fibrosis, improvement, finally improvement in cardiac structure and function, and another thing is attenuation of inflammation and reduction in the serum uric acid level. These are the landmark uh, outcome trials of SGLT2 inhibitors. AMPA-RED outcome trial is the ampagliflozin in cardiovascular outcome and mortality in type 2 diabetes patients. Patients with uh, type 2 diabetes at high risk for CV events, total 7,020 patients, randomized 1 is to 1 is to 1 fashion to ampagliflozin 10, 25 and placebo, <laughs> follow up in 3.1 years in uh, 590 sites of 42 countries. The primary composite outcome was the death from cardiovascular causes, non-fatal MI or non-fatal stroke, and key secondary composite outcome is primary outcome plus hospitalization for unstable angina. All these figures show that obviously show that there is an obvious reduction in the empagliflozin group for the primary outcome, with a P value less than 0.001 for non-inferiority and 0.04 for superiority. And also for the death from cardiovascular cause and death from any cause, AMPA group favors over the placebo and also for the hospitalization for heart failure. So amper -RED outcome trial summary is patient with type 2 diabetes at high risk for cardiovascular events who receive amper as compared with placebo had a low rate of primary composite cardiovascular outcome and of death from any cause when the study drug is added to the standard of care of other medications with the relative risk reduction of 14% for 3-point miss, 38% reduction, relative risk reduction for CV death, 32% relative risk reduction in all-cause mortality, 35% relative risk reduction in heart failure hospitalization, and 39% relative risk reduction in incident of worsening nephropathy. And all these safety profiles are consistent with the other clinical trials. No obvious uh, side effect or adverse effect occur. Next is the CANVAS program. This is the canagliflozim and cardiovascular and renal events. It is a two trials integration. CANVAS and CANVAS are total 10,142 patients uh, with type 2 diabetes and high CV risks. Canal and placebo uh, follow up for 188.2 weeks and primary outcome is composite of death from cardiovascular cause, non fatal MI or stroke. And this primary outcome was lower with canagliflozim than placebo and with the possible uh, progression of uh, renal protection, but there is a side of a prof, uh, risk of the risk of amputation primarily at the level of toe or metatarsal. This is the summary of the CANVAS program. Uh, all these uh, efficacy outcomes favor the uh, canagliflozin. Next is the declared TB58. This is tabagliflozin and cardiovascular outcome trial in type two diabetes also. 17,160 patients with type 2 diabetes and established CV disease and multiple risk factors received double 10 or placebo, follow up 4.2 years, 882 signs in 33 countries, with the primary safety outcome of composite maize, 
uh, cardiovascular death, MI or ischemic stroke. Primary efficacy outcomes of MACE and composite or cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure and secondary efficacy outcome of renal composite and death from any cause. And in this case, uh, primary endpoint, significantly lower rate of cardiovascular event and hospitalization for heart failure than placebo, but not show the significant lower rate of MACE. For the secondary endpoint also, uh, prote renal protection is a uh, favor of favor with type of group, but all cause mortality, it, the two group did not differ significantly. So TAPA was then inferior to placebo with respect to the composite safety outcome of cardiovascular death, MI or ischemic stroke. And also the safety events like TKA and genetic infection are more common in uh, TAPA group. This is the Credence trial. This is the canocliflozin in and renal events with diabetes with established nephropathy clinical evaluation. In this case, uh, diabetes with uh, GFR 30 to 90 and uh, albuminuria patients uh, with the primary composite endpoint of ESKD and renal or CV death. Uh, in this case, uh, both the primary outcome and CV death or hospitalization, canocliflozin group is uh, more reduction than placebo group. Next is the Vartis CV trial. This is the cardiovascular outcomes following artocliflozin treatment in patients with type 2 diabetes and atherosclerotic CVD. In this case, only heart failure, hospitalization for heart failure, artocliflozin has a reduction in than the placebo. But in case of primary MACE outcome and CV death, the two groups did not differ significantly. This is the systematic review and meta-analysis of this embarrassed outcome canvas trial, declared TME, Credence, and Virtus CV. All these meta-analysis of uh, SDLT2 inhibitor trials demonstrated a reduction in primary ASCVD based composite of time to first event of CV, death, MI, or stroke. Neither uh, DAPA and declared TME and uh, R2 cliflozin and Virtus CV did not reduce the risk of MACE, but both reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization. Another are the empagliflozin trials in AMI, the ME trial. But it is not the mortality outcome trial. The total 476 people with AMI were randomized to either EMPA-10 or placebo within 72 hours of PCI. And the outcome, uh, primary outcome was the anti-pro BMB concentration, and the secondary outcomes were echo, functional, and structural parameters like EF, E by E prime, LV, ETV, ESV, over 26 weeks of treatment. So in both cases, uh, the anti-pro BMB concentration is significantly lower in uh, empagliflozin group, and the EF is more improved in amper group, and both LV, ESV, LV, ETV are reduced in the amper group, and the also E1, E prime reduced in the amper group. So all favor the uh, progression to heart failure is reduced in the uh, amper cliflozin group. And this trial is the empagliflozin in AMI trial. Uh, randomly assigned the AMI patient within 72 hours of PCI. So in the portion of the diabetes mellitus in the trial is only uh, 12%. Next is the empagliflozin trial in MI without diabetes or heart failure. In this case, the primary composite outcome was the hierarchical composite outcome of seven data. First is the death of the first CV death followed by NAN CV death. Second is the hospitalization due to heart failure. That is NAN fatal MI. Fourth is AF letter event, uh, new onset DM, NYT classification, and body weight. So these primary hierarchical composite outcome, including seven components, resulted in 32.9 wins for double group. But these benefits are mainly driven by the cardiometabolic components, and the rate of composite of time to cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure was similar in both treatment group. So it is a uh, mortality is uh, not uh, different and similar in both group. So this is the ongoing trial, empagliflozin in patient post MI rationally and design of MPAT MI trial. It will evaluate safety and efficacy of AMPA compared with placebo in patient with hospitalized patient for MI with or at high risk for new onset of heart failure in addition to standard care. It's a multinational 
randomized double blind placebo control trial, 5,000 participants, 40 centers in 22 countries. Eligible patients are spontaneous MI with new signs or symptoms of pulmonary contraction or new retention in AVEF of 45% with at least one additional risk factor for development of future heart failure. Ampertin and placebo daily in addition to standard of, standard of care within 14 days of admission for MI. The primary composite endpoint is time to first hospitalization for heart failure or all cause mortality. And this will inform our clinical practice regarding the role of amber invasion after MI with high risk for development of future heart failure and mortality. The result is waiting. So as a conclusion, SDLT2 inhibitors were developed as an anti-diabetic agent, but accumulating evidence have shown their beneficial effect on our cardiovascular system. The therapeutic spectrum of SDLT2 are extended to non-diabetic patients since CV benefits are independent of glycemic control. So extensive clinical studies demonstrated that these SDLT2 inhibitors reduce the risk of CV death and hospitalization for heart failure in broad range of diabetes mellitus with all stages of heart failure with or without established coronary artery disease. And the use of SGLT2 inhibitors are also safe in patients with CKT. And for the empagliflozin, the difference in primary outcome trial, empagliflozin trial, is the benefits are become evident approximately only three months after starting the drug. So this impressive outcome result occur in addition to the background of new optimal treatment of BP lipid anticoagulation by uh, regular standard of care. So this speaks the ability of Amper to tackle some of the residual CV risks. But there is a still the question is whether Amper can improve CV outcome in patients with diabetes without pre-existing CV disease or Amper can improve CV outcome in patients with pre-existing CV disease without diabetes. Still the questions. Thank you. CFM, caring for well-being.